This movie title is weirdly hard for me to get right. I've referred to it as Good Times at El Royale, Bad Times at Hotel Royale, and Bad Times at Casino Royale. Why can't my brain process this film's title? Hey up guys! So today's film that I'm reviewing is the latest film that is written and directed by Drew Goddard, the man that gave us one of my favourite films of all time, The Cabin in the Woods. Six years later, he has finally done another film about bloody time. This one's called Bad Times at El Royale and stars Jeff Bridges, John Hamm, Dakota Johnson, Lewis Pullman, Kaylee Spaney, Cynthia Erivo, and Chris Hemsworth as a group of strangers that show up to this hotel in 1969 on one stormy night. Blood is spilt, secrets are exposed, and the night becomes a game of survival. Bad times indeed. This film had the potential to be a pulpy, paranoid puzzler, but sadly feels more like a sluggish, mediocre attempt at pulling off Tarantino. There's definitely a hateful eight vibe here as it's got shady characters, all in one location with a high body count. I wasn't a massive fan of the hateful eight, but I would say that bad times at the ho at the hotel row at the hotel row the L row. God, this movie's title. Wait a minute, is it is it bad times at the El Royale or bad times at El Royale? Wait, 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 wait. <gasps> But I forgot to mention the the. Oh fuck. Oh shit. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Oh, this just proves my point though that this film's title is just impossible for my brain to comprehend. I can't get it right. Bad times at the El Royale. Oh god. All right, I'm I'm not going back and doing the introduction again. Okay, this is just this is way too funny to uh, to go back and do it again. So yeah. Continuing the review of Bad Times at the El Royale. Yeah, I like, gather my dignity, <laughs> whatever little bit remains. I wasn't a massive fan of The Hateful Eight, and I would say that Bad Times at the El Royale falls into the same category, that it's entertaining enough, but it doesn't have any satisfying, suspenseful payoff. Tarantino and Goddard both have far superior work. Let's start with the positives, okay? The first thing that I really loved about this film was the production design of it. Apart from a few flashbacks, this film primarily takes place at one location, which is the Hotel Royale. <laughs> And yeah, when you have a film that takes place at just one location, it's pivotal that the location provides atmosphere for the film. And that's one thing that this film gets spot on. This setting definitely gives the film a vibe, a feeling, and it's very 60s and it looks meticulously accurate. I think the design of the hotel looks great. The hotel sits on top of the state lines of California and Nevada. I honestly thought that this plot detail that the hotel was sitting on top of two states was gonna come into play a bit more as the film progressed and it would have some significance, but it really doesn't do anything to inform the story or the characters or affect the narrative in any way, really. Yeah, I kind of thought it was a little bit pointless. But Martin Wist has done a very good job of the set design. He really has an eye for detail. The casting is also superb, but some definitely have more to work with than others. The standout in this film is definitely Cynthia Erivo, who plays the soulful lounge singer Darlene. She is the film's best asset, and she's definitely one to watch out for because she was also in Steve McQueen's Widows, and yeah, she also gets to sing in this. She even gets the best scene in this film when John Hamm's vacuum cleaner salesman starts spying on her, but yeah, she sings in this scene, and when you do hear her vocals in this scene, it's chilling for two reasons. One, because of how talented she is, and secondly, because it gives the scene a very unorthodoxly creepy atmosphere but it works very well. Jeff Bridges I liked a lot in this too as Father Flynn. He's a man with a checkered past and a checkered mind, but when this film starts to peel the layers back of his character, you can really see he's quite vulnerable and fragile because he is just an old man who doesn't have a lot of time left, and Bridges really gets you to care for him. And Chris Hemsworth also does a really good job here as this Charles Manson-like cult leader called Billy Lee. I think it's in Chris Hemsworth's contract that he has to be topless in every film that he's in, but I don't blame him. The dude's got some obliques in this film. But he does nail his American accent and gets to have chewy fun here. Everybody else gives a fine performance, but they don't feel as integral to the plot, so they feel a bit forgettable. Dakota Johnson 
Johnson's femme fatale Emily Summerspring feels underdeveloped, as does Kaylee Spaney's character. John Hamm's vacuum salesman Laramie Seymour Sullivan has a very Frank Underwood accent, but he does enough to grab your attention at first. And again, he does get the best scene along with Cynthia Erivo when he's spying on her. So yeah, the characters in general are rather hit or miss. One of my main issues that I have with this film is its pacing. This film is two hours and 20 minutes long. I don't mind if it's a slow burn film, but it needs to have a satisfactory bit of payoff towards the end which I honestly don't think this film has. And the one thing that Drew Goddard is missing with his script is the zingy wit of Joss Whedon, which made Cabin in the Woods so much fun to watch. And if your scenes aren't full of juicy, snappy dialogue, then it can feel a bit slow in places. And I definitely felt that this film was a bit sluggish. And honestly, I didn't think this film's finale had that much oomph. It just felt a bit flat to me. It wasn't bad, it's just nothing that comes close to the clever subversiveness of The Cabin in the Woods. That film surprised everybody. But the most surprising thing about Bad Times at the El Royale was probably when Xavier Dolan showed up as this slimy music mogul in Darlene's flashback. And yeah, when I saw his face in it, I was like, oh, well, that's a nice surprise. Okay, so let's ask those three questions. Would I watch this again? Hmm, ooh, I don't know, because mysteries are sometimes good to watch again a second time round because you can spot hidden clues and foreshadowing, like, once you know what's coming. But, oh, I don't really think there's enough enigma or mystery in Bad Times at the El Royale to warrant a second viewing. I'd much rather watch Cabin in the Woods again than give this another watch. Would I recommend it for you guys? It's not that this film's not entertaining, but it does feel a little bit flat. I don't think it's unwatchable, but I also don't think it's worth paying money to see it at a cinema. I'd say this is probably a film to watch on a streaming platform. And what score do I give it out of 10? Well, there's some pretty good performances in this and the production design is excellent. And there's also one sequence in this which I thought was supremely well constructed and I thought was very well done. However, the script isn't as smart as it thinks it is and it definitely has some problems with its pacing. And yeah, the finale, I thought lacked impact. So I'm gonna give Bad Times at the El Royale a score of five out of 10. There we go, guys. Those are my thoughts on Bad Times at the El Royale, which is going to haunt me forever because I can never get the name of it right. But I wanna know, what did you guys think of the film? Whatever you think, be sure to let me know in the comment section below. If you guys do like this content, please don't forget to click that subscribe button. And if you guys want to follow me on Twitter, Instagram, or Stardust, all that information is in the description link below. <laughs> Thank you so much for watching, guys. For more things related to movies, TV, and popcorn culture, I'm Luke Airfield, and I'll see you next time.